questions the human mind cannot answer. Out of reach, past all we can see, hear and touch, beyond all we understand, lies... The Extraordinary. Hey man, what's that blood coming from? What the hell did you do, man? The Extraordinary is the mysterious death of this man, a renowned investigator of psychic phenomena. Most important, gotta wipe all our fingerprints off, man. Uh... When police went in search of clues, they found one sent from another world by the departed victim. You're willing to listen to anybody to give you another lead on a case to try and solve this thing. It is the story of Walter Craig and a horse named Nimblefoot. Not a racing story, but one of a rare dream of triumph and death. Head and head may race to the line, this will be very close. The Extraordinary is the bizarre house of old tires that actor Dennis Weaver calls home. We wanted to take an environmental problem and make an asset of it. Hello, counsel. Remember me? And the vivid apparition that gave nightmares to Hollywood superstar Robert Mitchum. That's what shocked me, you know, something real. It is the criminal caught by a most bizarre happening. A clue left at the scene. One that only he could have left. The extraordinary is the appearance of a dead man in this photograph. I had me doubts about things like this, but now I think I am a believer. A dead man whose image certainly astounded his family. Just some of the stories that lie beyond our normal understanding. Tonight on The Extraordinary. That photograph has even the experts baffled. Good evening. I'm Warwick Moss. At first it seemed like a random murder. A Los Angeles man, D. Scott Rogo, was found slain in his home after a neighbour noticed his lawn sprinkler had been running for two days. Then it was learned Rogo was an investigator of psychic phenomena and the murder investigation led to a clue beyond this world. The neighbors noticed that the sprinkler had been running for two days. He wasn't the kind of man to forget to turn it off. They noticed too that he had left his door ajar. He was more cautious than that. Something had to be wrong, so one of them made the call. There had been a murder in this house on Schoenborn Street in North Ridge in Los Angeles' San Fernando Valley. The man whose body lay on the floor between the living room and the den, Scott Rogo, was not your average victim. He was a lecturer, one of the country's foremost experts on the paranormal the noted author of 30 books, a faculty member at John F. Kennedy University, a regular guest on television news and talk shows. Someone had stabbed him countless times and he had bled to death in the office where he had written such works as The Poltergeist Experience, Leaving the Body, and Phone Calls from the Dead. The co-author of many of his books was this woman, Ann Druffel. He was a mind who was just beginning to realize that the human being is not just a materialistic uh, form of life, but that they have a spirit which lives on after death. If he had lived, I think he would have uh, been a force to 
convince other parapsychologists of the spiritual nature of uh, human beings. Rogo lived alone, but mixed in a world of psychics, parapsychologists, mediums, and mystics. Their work was his lifelong investigation. In his personal life, those who knew him described him as a gentle, kind man, very often a Samaritan to the homeless, the jobless, and the needy. He would try to help someone who was less fortunate than himself get on their feet. And I believe that the perpetrator of the crime was a person that he had become acquainted with in this manner. And in the weeks following Rogo's murder, police focused on an itinerant hitchhiker he had met and befriended three years earlier, a man named John Batista. They scoured the crime scene for any signs of Batista's presence, dusting for fingerprints in the office, the kitchen, and the bathroom. They took evidence from the house and stored it in plastic bags, and they believed they had checked every square millimeter of every object. They found several prints, but none that matched these prints of Batista. He was removed from the suspect list, which left police without a single clue to the murder. From his statements, though, we believed him to be a, a, a fairly good suspect. But uh, without that print identifying him at the crime scene, we didn't have a case to file on him. Weeks, then months passed with no movement on the case. Ann Druffel and other friends of Rogo grew angry and impatient. Independently, they made a decision to search for a clue in their own field, paranormal or psychic detection. Druffel turned to a psychic named Armand Marcotte. In the first phone reading, Marcotte saw two men at the scene. His second vision was recorded on tape while Marcotte clutched Rogo's letter opener and the shirt he died in. It was during this very reading, Marcotte says, Scott Rogo told him where to find the evidence to convict his own killer. The tape of Rogo's message from the grave would finger his assailant. I do see Mr. Rogo opening up the door. Hey, Scott. John. How are you doing, buddy? It's my buddy Carlos I told you about. Hi, Carlos. According to the vision, Batista asked about work. One of them used to live there. And I says, he's a friend, and he knows Scott Rogo, and he's a friend. So what are we talking about, huh? $20. There was a problem over the money Rogo offered. Carlos would be, you know, in 20 bucks. He's like... Oh, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't take much to, it's like 25. They sat down and started talking, and Scott was talking to the one that used to live there with him. Just little leaves, that's all. You just pick them up and put them in the bag and put them over there. It's, it's, it's half hour. The intruder tried to up the price to $65. $65. We'll do some extra work for you, whatever you need, man. I'm telling you, John, there, there isn't $65 worth of work to be done. $25 is more than fair. And so they got into a fight, an argument. Hey, listen, Scott, man. $65 is not that much. You're making and, a fool out of Then tempers God, rose. There was physical $65. contact. You're embarrassing me in front of Carlos here, man. $65. you are embarrassing me in front of a man. I want to that, 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 Put your hands away. That, and suddenly, that, that, the fight oh, turned wow. deadly. Oh, my God. I says, they're killing him. Hey, man. What's that blood coming from? What the hell did you do, I man? Him. Man, are you nuts? They're both so nervous, they're shaking out of their body, you know. I need a drink. The intruders panicked and planned their escape. All right, Carlos, a little drink. We're OK. We'll be all right. Everything will be cool. We'll get out of town. They're having a drink, and they're talking. Well, what we do, and he says, the best thing for us to do is get out of here. Uh, most importantly, we got to wipe all our fingerprints off, man. Uh, they had to off. cover their tracks. All right, I'm going to go to the bathroom. You start wiping your prints off. Everything you, uh, we touched, uh, I'll be right out. All right? All right. Okay. Cool. I oh, says, the one that lived there told the other one, make sure you wipe your glass off. And he went into Scott right. Rogel's private bathroom. And he left his glass there and never wiped it off. Everything's cool. Everything will be all right. We're going down. And I said, the policeman overlooked that because they thought it was Scott Srogo's glass. A lone smudged fingerprint on the side of a glass. Somehow the forensic unit had missed it when they dusted the glass. 
But the tape of Rogo's message from beyond triggered new action. Los Angeles detective Tim Moss looked at the absence of clues and figured, why not? Especially when a case comes to a dead end, uh, you're willing to listen to about anybody to give you another lead on a case to try and solve this thing. He ordered the re-examination of all the physical evidence gathered at the crime scene. In particular, the empty bourbon glass found in Scott Rogo's bathroom. A clue in the final moment of Rogo's life that they might have missed. And there it was, a solitary fingerprint, the indelible signature of Scott Rogo's killer, John Batista. A perfect match. In December of 1991, John Batista was sentenced to 13 years in jail for second degree murder. He has since appealed. The second man at the scene has never been found. The afternoon on the first Tuesday in November each year, Australia comes to a standstill for three and a half minutes. The nation stops for a horse race, just about the most famous horse race in the world, the Melbourne Cup. Millions of dollars are wagered, fortunes created, legends born. But there's a largely untold story about the Cup. The day in 1870, when a horse named Nimblefoot lined up for the famous two-miler. It's every punter's dream to own a horse that wins the Melbourne Cup. Back in 1870, one owner actually did dream that his horse Nimblefoot would be first past the post in that classic race. Or was it really a nightmare? If you'd been at Flemington for the Cup in 1870, Nimblefoot was certainly worth a flutter. History records that the five to one favourite was a horse called Lapdog, and the punters loved him. One bookie alone was holding 50,000 pounds on Lapdog to win. Poor old Nimblefoot was 12 to one. But as you'll see, there was one bet on Nimblefoot where the odds were even longer. The six-year-old Bay Gelding was owned by Walter Craig, who made his money in Ballarat's wild gold rush days. In fact, he did so well that in 1857, he bought one of the flashiest hotels in town. But according to local historian Lloyd Jenkins, for all Mr. Craig's good fortune, there was just as much misfortune. He was lucky in business, but not so lucky in other areas. Unlucky in family life because three of his children died during his years of ownership of Craig's Hotel. He was unlucky in the horse racing world as an owner because it seemed that any horse that he uh, became uh, the owner of had no success. Early on, Nibblefoot looked as though he'd put a stop to that losing streak. Then he too broke down, but Craig didn't lose heart. Every racehorse owner hopes and thinks that he in due course will win the Melbourne Cup with a horse. In the year 1870, in February of that year, Walter Craig was sufficiently confident about his horse, Nimblefoot, winning the Cup that year, that he took what might be described as almost a bizarre bet. That bet was made in the billiard room of Craig's Hotel on the night of February the 10th, 1870. As it turned out, nine months to the day before the big race. For Melbourne bookmaker Joe Slack, it was a wager too good to refuse. Walter Craig said to Mr Slack, what odds will you give me for Croydon, for the Sydney Metropolitan and Nimblefoot for the Melbourne Cup as a double? Mr. Slack counted the people present, eight, and he said, I will lay 1,000 pounds to eight drinks against that combination. Good odds for Walter Craig. 
and it's well documented that the deal was sealed. But local legend has it that there was an even more bizarre bet that night. The bar talk around town is that Craig also gambled he wouldn't be there to see Nimblefoot romp home in the cup. Why? Because he'd just had a dream. A dream which is certainly documented in the history books. In his dream, Walter Craig saw himself at Flemington Racecourse on Melbourne Cup Day, 1870. He saw a horse wearing his own violet silks pass the post as the winner of the Melbourne Cup. He spoke to the jockey. What is the name of the horse? Nimblefoot was the answer. Who was the owner of Nimblefoot? The jockey replied, I do not know, but Nimblefoot used to be owned by Walter Craig of Ballarat. Used to be owned by Walter Craig? Well, there was more to the dream. Something much more disturbing. Nimblefoot's jockey was also wearing black armbands. And that could mean only one thing. Walter Craig was convinced he'd die before the race was run. That's the barrier for the 1870 Melbourne Cup. When Cup Day came around on November the 10th, Nimblefoot's track record and his age didn't exactly endear him to the punters. In fact, veteran race commentator Des Hoisted says at best he would have been an outside chance. In fact, the handicapper only gave him six stone in imperial terms, which corresponds to about 45 kilos or something today. So. He was a lightweight. At the start, the favourite, Lapdog, got away well. The only real challenger was the highly fancied horse, Warrior. Then a couple of furlongs from home, the impossible happened. Nimblefoot came from nowhere and began to live up to his name. Yes, Nimblefoot did win the cup, just as his owner predicted. Also, as Walter Craig predicted, the jockey John Day was wearing black crepe armbands, a mark of respect for a death in the racing fraternity. The death of Walter Craig. You see, Walter Craig had died from pneumonia just 12 weeks before the big race on August the 16th, 1870. Yet another part of his dream had come true. The part that dogged him to his grave. So what about that thousand pound bet? The one made here in the billiard room of Craig's hotel. Remember, Walter Craig took the unlikely double with bookie Joe Slack. Croydon to win the Sydney Metropolitan and Nimblefoot to win the Melbourne Cup. Well, as we've seen, good old Nimblefoot came home and so did Croydon. Mr. Slack, the bookmaker, honoured the debt from which he could have backed away, but it was a debt of honour as far as he was concerned and he paid the £1,000 due to Mrs Craig. We older TV viewers remember Dennis Weaver as the limping deputy Chester in the long-running Western series, Gunsmoke. Later, he rode his trusty horse into the big city in a series called McLeod. And the other day, he climbed out of the saddle to talk to us about some more personal thoughts. It was me that was waiting, Mr. Dillon. <laughs> me and the first sergeant. You see, when I got there... Never mind, Chester, it doesn't matter. Albert Schweitzer said that the, the uh, disaster of this civilization that we live in is that we have developed more materially than we have spiritually. 
Well, beats me, Mr. Dillon. They just disappeared, the whole kit and caboodle of them. The deficit or the interest rates or the homelessness or the hunger or the drugs or the crime, none of those things will really make any difference because uh, if we don't have an environment to live in, uh, people won't be here. And so those other problems won't be here. Chester Good, the legendary deputy of the classic American TV series Gunsmoke, wasn't the kind of character you'd expect to immerse himself in the philosophies of Albert Schweitzer and the politics of saving the planet. But the actor Dennis Weaver has come a long way since Dodge City. He's a man who ponders the human condition and the future of the world from a house and office that overlooks an endless expanse of the Pacific on Malibu Beach. Weaver the private man is not Chester, nor even the McLeod character he played years later. He is a man deeply rooted in his concerns for the environment, the need for humans to get along with each other, and his family. For 47 years, he's been married to the same woman, Jerry, which in itself is an amazing record in Hollywood. They've got three grown sons. And sometimes they live in their Colorado house with a message. It's made totally from old car tires and tin cans. The Earth ship, as we call it, uh is an example of uh, what can be done if you have an awareness of the problem. And uh, my wife and I, Jerry, uh, we really wanted to make some kind of statement. And since we were talking about the environment so much, we really wanted to uh, walk our talk in a sense. We wanted to take an environmental problem and make an asset out of it. Weaver took the old tires, the environmental plague of the 20th century, and use them as rubber bricks to build a house that keeps a steady temperature year round. And we took the tires and we pounded the tires full of dirt, really pounded it in there tight so that it was really dense. And the greater the density, the greater the mass. When we got finished with each tire, they weighed about 400 pounds a piece. So we used these tire bricks to build the walls of the house so that every living space in the house is surrounded by this huge amount of mass. People think that this is what we are, this body is what we are. It's not what we are, it houses what we are. And that which we eternally are, the spirit within, the soul, the higher self, uh, that always was and always will be. It's just like putting on a different coat when we're, you know, we put on different clothes. In a sense, that's a parallel. Because we're not the clothes, we're not the hat, we're not the car we drive. So, in a like manner, we're not this body. There's something deeper that we are. And that's the spirit within it. Weaver is also a strong believer in reincarnation. I mean, you can't learn it all in one lifetime. That, that's kind of silly to think that we can you know, we're here for 60, 70, 80, 100 years, and, and, uh, and then it's, uh, it's all learned, it's, or it's all developed, it's all over. I think of reincarnation as a kind of a purifying process, or a relearning process, if you will. It's kind of like water that's running down uh, in a mountain stream. Uh, it goes over a lot of bumps and rocks and uh, all kinds of obstacles and etc. But, and it's in a sense painful, uh, it's agitated, and the same happens to us as we go through life. There's a lot of pain we deal with and a lot of agitation. But as the water is, uh, uh, goes over these rocks, it also is aerated, it's purified, until finally it gets to the point where it's, it's, it's really pure. And that's the journey of the soul. Do you believe we're the only form of life in the universe? Oh no. That would be very presumptuous of us, wouldn't it? I, I, why in all of the billions and billions of stars and planets and that we should be the only life? I mean, that doesn't make mathematical sense to me. When Henry Fox Talbot invented the camera in the 1830s, 
I'm sure he had no idea how popular the concept of photography would become. We've all used a camera at some time to capture that special moment, to freeze time so that we can carry it with us through the years. But sometimes, as we've seen on this show, those photographs reveal images that cannot be explained. This photograph, which is the subject of tonight's story, has baffled even the experts. This is the photograph, an ordinary family snap. Well, take a look at the negative, especially the top left-hand corner. It probably looks like nothing more than a puff of smoke, but it's not quite that simple, according to Peter Hunter, who's worked for Kodak for more than 30 years. In his Melbourne laboratory, Peter has investigated thousands of negatives, faulty cameras, even trick photography. Usually, he's been able to find a logical answer, but not this time. Not even with the latest, most advanced technology. I can't see that in all my experience the film would ever produce an image like that. The camera, well, cameras aren't designed to do things like that, but odd things can happen. The photograph in question was taken by Tony Fennick in April last year. Tony, his wife Connie, and their large extended family had gathered to celebrate a birthday in Melbourne. And he was determined to capture all the highlights on film. But there was one face missing that day. Connie's brother Lawrence, who was away in Canada. Oh, we were very close. All of us were close. We were close, nine kids of us, brothers and sisters. But he was sort of kind of special, always. When the photographs of the party came back from the processor, no one noticed anything unusual. Not even in the shot of three youngsters we showed you earlier. But then by sheer chance, a few weeks later, me and my wife were at the kitchen at the time and my son was uh, just scrounging around for the negatives and he found it. And he came running up to us and said, look at this, there's a ghost in the picture. My wife saw it first and she told me. And I was a bit startled because really I... I had me doubts about things like this, but now I think I am a believer. A normal photograph, an abnormal negative. A negative with an unusual image in one corner. But it became even more unusual when Connie looked closer. She says it's the spitting image of her brother Lawrence, the one living in Canada. We were looking at it over and over and over again, trying to make something out of it. Who is it or where did it come from? The moustache on it, that's what really gave it away. Because it really looked exactly like my brother now let's think about the shape and the features the eyes the mustache and all that that is unusual that is really something i don't believe i can give any explanation to peter hunter from kodak not only put the negative through an exhaustive series of tests he also ran off a new batch of prints this time though he made them slightly lighter and sure enough there in the corner is that image, the one with the remarkable resemblance to Lawrence. I do agree it has a remarkable resemblance to the look of that man, and it's unusual, obviously, for a, a, a smoke puff to look like a man, and in this case, even more so, that it's someone that this family knows. Maybe the eyes and the moustache are there in that smoky apparition. But there was one thing that still troubled Connie and her family. We weren't sure that it was him because the one on the negative, it's got no hair on at the top. It just had some hair on the back. And my brother was always full of hair. Nice big curly hair. Then Connie came up with an explanation for that lack of hair. Six weeks after the photograph was taken, Lawrence had died in Canada. He died of cancer. And at the time Tony Fennick actually took the photograph, 
Lawrence was undergoing extensive chemotherapy. After he passed away and uh, talking to my other brother in Canada, and you know, you want to know a lot of things, what really happened in the last minutes of his life and that. And he told us that he had lost all his hair. The message was his worst still day, but the hair wasn't there. An uncanny likeness of a dying loved one, even down to Lawrence losing his hair during his medical treatment. Or just a fluke photograph. The final verdict from the expert Peter Hunter. I really can't give any logical explanation. I don't believe it was a, a fault with the camera and I'm certain it couldn't have been a fault with the film. <laughs> Veteran actor Robert Mitchum is one of the most respected men in Hollywood. Mitchum doesn't give many interviews these days, so when he invited us to join him for a chat, we didn't hesitate to go along. And what we found was quite surprising. Hello, Councillor. Remember me? Mitchum has never been a Hollywood pretty boy. He's always played men's men. Tough, no pulled punches, no time for small talk. I'm gonna give you just one hour to get rid of your friends. And women loved it. Are you trying to pick me up? Yes. He dominated the screen in the Australian movie The Sundowners in 1960. Showed his durability by starring in both the 61 version of Cape Fear and again in the 91 remake with Robert De Niro. Take the law into his own hands. His name is on the marquee of classics like The Longest Day, The Big Sleep, and Ryan's Daughter. And in all of them, Mitchum wasn't the kind of actor to equivocate about the type of guy he is. He tells it like it is, fears no man, and treats women with the kind of rough chivalry that comes from a time gone by. Kissing you is nice, but your father did not hire me to sleep with you. But when we talk to him, at the famed Biltmore Hotel in Santa Barbara, California, Mitchum first showed us his gentler side. Trouble steeps in sullen pools along the way I've taken. Sightless windows stare the empty street. No love beckons me save that which I've forsaken, and the sorrow of my solitude is sweet. We'll get back to the poem in a moment. We were curious about a tough guy's experience with matters of the unexplained and his thoughts of this life and beyond. Do you believe in reincarnation? I think it's my only shot. What do you think happens when we die? Huh. A small sigh somewhere. But... but Mitchum says that if he could come back again, he'd like another shot at being himself, only better the second time around. Well, I might have been a lot more, a lot kinder in my understanding and my, uh, my acceptance of people. And uh, being less uh, concerned about my own survival than someone else's survival. I may have, at times, uh, well, honorably, but ne nevertheless, uh, expended too much energy in my own cause at the expense of someone who is lame, you know, someone who could use the help that I might offer. And in matters that are really from the beyond, Mitchum even saw an apparition, a memory that stays with him to this day. I remember one time I was in Dover, Delaware, and I borrowed a car from some friend of mine. And uh, I was driving out down to the beach, Bowers Beach. And on the way down, out of the marsh, an apparition appeared. It was a fixture on the side of the road, and it moved, it loomed up. 
for a millionth of a second, I started to stop, and then I rushed on. That's what shocked me, you know, it was something real. And uh, what the hell I was doing there and why, I don't know. I'm sure it, it, it had nothing to do with me. It just appeared, and I happened to be coming along, and some hideous witch jumped up out of the swamp. And But it has recurred to me in, you know, in diminishing nightmares. The apparition incident happened during a rough, poor childhood that ranged from jumping freight trains to doing time on a chain gang. Yet even then, Mitchum's poem to his mother showed a gentleness behind the tough exterior the world would come to know. I wrote to my mother on a penny postcard when they still had penny postcards when I was on this chain gang. She didn't receive it for years until they shut the joint down. And it said, uh, trouble steeps in sullen pools along the way I've taken. Sightless windows stare the empty street. No love beckons me save that which I have forsaken. And the sorrow of my solitude is sweet. Obviously 15 years old. An interesting man. Crime. Unfortunately, it's part of our daily lives. Most crooks, thankfully, face justice. Brought undone by good detective work, on the ball policemen and women, or circumstances that defy explanation. This is the story of a man brought to justice by a million to one chance. <laughs> Fingerprints, the classic way to catch a thief. The oldest, but still the surest means of tracking down a suspect. They're every criminal's individual calling card, and Australian police have millions of them on file. Each print is different. Each could help them solve a crime. But there's one crime that still has Inspector Peter Butcher of the New South Wales Fingerprint Bureau shaking his head in amazement quite an unusual set of circumstances. Let's go back to the scene of the crime, to the 25th of January, 1977. It's around one o'clock in the morning, and a gang of would-be burglars are casing the Terrace restaurant in Bondi. They've had a few beers and they reckon it's worth a crack. So the youngest of the three is elected to do the break and enter, via a first floor kitchen window. Getting in isn't a problem. Getting out with the loot will prove to be the downfall of this teenage crook. The first clue was picked up by Senior Sergeant Brian McHugh from Bondi Police. When I went outside, there, uh, there was a, a very large amount of blood and it was in splatters leading down an alleyway behind the building. That trail led police back to the smashed window. The fingerprint expert, during his initial examination, failed to uh, develop or locate any usable fingerprints, but he did notice that there was a considerable amount of blood at the actual point of entry and the surrounds, and it was rather obvious that the, the suspect had cut himself quite severely during the entry or the escape. And much to his amazement, he in fact found a piece of skin tissue which he at first thought was congeal blood on the windowsill. In fact, it was a, a portion of a finger and it was still sitting on the, on the window glass itself. Back at headquarters, the forensic experts couldn't believe their luck. Even in ideal conditions, it's not easy to capture the perfect print. But here, they had the real thing, a fingertip to work with. We were able to remove the outer layer of skin and place it on a glass surface, apply fingerprinter's ink to the actual skin tissue and reproduce that fingerprint in perfect form. 
having that perfect print was a good start, but there was still a long way to go. Countless criminal files to be sifted through in an attempt to match the print and track down the villain. Unfortunately, our weeks and weeks of investigation failed to locate a suspect, but because of the unusual and bizarre circumstances of the crime scene examination, it developed into quite a challenge that who was going to identify the offender first, the fingerprint section or the local police at Bondi. Round one in the contest between the Boffins and the boys in blue went to Bondi. Just three weeks after the robbery, they got the tip-off that eventually cracked the case. By chance, a suspicious character had been brought in for questioning. A young man who just happened to have two fingers on his left hand heavily bandaged. At first, the suspect denied everything. He claimed he'd injured his hand in a motorbike accident. But then, well, why don't we let the man himself tell the story? Because after 16 years, we actually managed to catch up with him. They said, well, we're going to conf confront you with, with a bit of truth here. They said, do you know anything about um, a burglary at a restaurant in Bondi there? And I said, no, I don't know what you're talking about. So and they said, well, we think you do. And then the detective had the bit of finger in, in the jar. And when you're confronted with the truth like, like that, I sort of said, well, what can I say? Not only did he confess, he also spilled the beans on his inglorious exit through the kitchen window. The drain pipe gave way and as I was falling, I grabbed hold of the window. And because everything happened so quickly, I didn't realise that I, was, I sliced the, the top of my finger right off. And uh, so he hit the ground. I think I lost uh, conscious for about 30, 40, maybe f 50 seconds, you know. So, and then when I sort of come to, my two friends were just sort of staring at me in, in, in amazement that, that I was still alive. He still bears the scars of the escape and the indignity of the arrest. We had his finger, uh, which had been removed from his hand. So what we were able to do was uh, look at fingerprints of the suspect that had been taken on a previous occasion and in fact match up the finger with the set of fingerprints that were taken for a previous offence. An ingenious piece of detective work, helped along by a set of unique circumstances and the odd stroke of luck. The one and only recorded case where Australian police have literally been able to finger the crook.